My name is Vijay Raja. I'm going to meet most of you this evening or this afternoon. Uh, thank you for. Uh, we would love to be able to present this case live. Unfortunately, we couldn't find a, an appropriate candidate, so most of my stuff will be through the slides. So if we can just put up the slides and not look at me, it'd be easier to go through this. With can you, let me know when the slides are up. Please? Slides are up. Okay, great. <clears throat> so um, we are going to be talking about paravalvular leaks. Um, it's easier to talk about this as a definition first off. A paravalvular or paraprosthetic leak is uh, something that refers to a leak um, of blood through a channel between the structure and an implanted valve or cardiac tissue that has had a lack of appropriate sealing. So you can imagine um, most of the structures of the heart are not perfectly circular. Um, and even though our devices are created to be perfectly round, um, most things in the human body are not that shaped. And so we rely a great deal on our surgical expertise from our surgeons um, and prior sur other surgeons from other facilities to appropriately seal these valves in, in appropriate position. Um, sometimes the healing is not appropriate the sutures get lost, or there's a great degree of calcium that builds up, and that allows for a leak to develop. The incidence of this leak is more common in mechanical valves compared to bioprosthetic valves. It's estimated that it could be as high as 20%, including not small, non-significant jets. It's more common in the mitral. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, it's more common in the mitral and aortic prosthetic valves. Um, but the more clinically significant paravalvular leaks are apparent in about 1 to 5% of total cases. So as we talked about it earlier, the, um, the cause of these things are usually because of a disruption of the sewing rings, um, technical factors during the surgery, including calcification, and an incomplete acquisition <coughs> of the valvular structure as described as the fact that these are circular, usually circular-shaped um, um, devices that do not appear opposed well to the walls. So how do patients present? Um, the majority of our patients will present with heart failure symptoms, um, so difficult control, um, either through arrhythmias or, or just regular um, heart failure. Um, the majority of them will actually have preserved systolic function, um, but the, because of the mechanical failure of the valve itself or the paravalvular leak, um, that is what's causing their, their redundant uh, hospitalizations. The other type of presentation that we've had is uh, hemolytic anemia. So those patients who have a chronic or a very um, significant amount of blood loss and require frequent tr transfusions. And the last indication is usually for infectious endocarditis. Um, those patients that have a known leak and uh, for these turbulent jets are usually locations of where um, an infection, anitis can occur. So the diagnosis is usually started with the transthoracic echocardiogram, which is just the chest wall echocardiogram. Um, but the better way of assessing these is through a transesophageal echocardiogram. Um, it tells us the shape and the orientation of the jet, the number of jets, and how often we, or how many things that we need to close, how ba bad the velocity is, and how significant of a leak it is. Um, it also tells us um, what the pulmonary pressures are and how significant the flow reversal may be in the pulmonary veins if it's a, uh, around the mitral annulus. The treatment can vary um, between surgical and also transcatheter uh, interventions. Surgical is usually a limitation in these patients, um, and so specifically they've already had one surgery or maybe even multiple in most cases. Uh, and so that's where we as interventional cardiologists are involved. Um, we are able to occlude uh, these devices uh, or occlude these leaks uh, through a percutaneous approach depending on the location of the leak. So most of the time for a mitral paravalvular leak will go from the femoral vein and through a transeptal puncture. Um, if it's an aortic paravalvular leak, we usually go from a retrograde approach coming from the femoral artery and coming up, through the, up, up around the aortic arch. So in order to, I mean, we'd love to be able to show you a live case, but uh, we will talk about a couple of cases that we have done already at our institution. Um, the first case was a 76-year-old lady, um, very pleasant, had a prior mitral, uh, history of mitral valve prolapse and had prior mitral valve repair. Um, this took for several years and, and ultimately required a mitral valve replacement, so this is her second sternotomy. Um, she came in with persistent heart failure symptoms post-surgery, including persistent atrial fibrillation, and was not able to adequately manage with the, um, oral diuretics and, and our rate control therapy and, as, um, and antiarrhythmics. She kept having recurrent heart failure missions and um, consistent significant leak, um, significant shortness of breath. It was ultimately diagnosed with a transesophageal echocardiogram that, echocardiogram that she had a mitral paraprosthetic leak. And so this is, uh, I hope these pictures are playing um, uh, are. pretty well, but this is uh, on, the, on the left, thank you. On the left is just kind of a baseline to kind of look at what um, a normal TE looks like. So the top of this is gonna be your left atrium. Um, this is the left side 
and this is, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, is that there, we Dr. Can. Olson? Okay, great, perfect. On the right side is the right atrium and right ventricle. So um, it, this is where you see the mitral apparatus. On this view is actually our patient. You can see that she has, this does look a little different compared to the picture on the left or the movie on the left. That is her mitral um, valve replacement and that's the ring around it. So you can see that there is, this is a color Doppler and what we're looking for is typically if there is a leak because of the valve itself causing a problem, the jet would be coming through the valve itself and the bioprosthetic valve. Instead, we see the leak coming around the valve itself. And that's by definition that fits that criteria for paraprosthetic or paravalvular leak. The next couple of pictures are just kind of looking at it from different images. And so now we have rotated the camera around and we can see that this is close <laughs> to the aorta, which is, um, and, and where that leak, and, and it, it, these the leaks will tend to have a different track. And so this one kind of looks like a snake-like progression as you see it kind of go from the valve itself and track around. Um, one interesting note is this lady um, uh, was very difficult to get. What we like to do in these situations is get a 3D imaging. Um, unfortunately, because of just her small habitus and, and small size, we can only fit a pediatric probe. And so you'll see on the second case how, better, how much better quality imaging we get with a uh, 3D probe. But in this instance, this is just using our pediatric probe, but we were still able to get adequate imaging and kind of plan pre-procedure of how we we're going to close this. So the pictures on the left, or the movies on the left, are actually through our transeptal. Um, and after we've gotten our sheath into the left atrium, usually we would like to be able to do this both with a 3D and actually show where our catheter is and where the leak is. In this situation, we had to use fluoro, um, or x-ray, live x-ray, as well as um, the 2D images in order to kind of find where our catheter was going to be directed and how we can cross that valve, the, the, the valve itself. And so you can see the catheter the sheath across the intraatrial septum, and then a guide that's actually across into the left ventricle from the left atrium around the valve. And you can kind of faintly see that there's a ring, and that is the mitral valve itself. We exchange that for a wire, and eventually <coughs> we put in our first device. And Dr. Mego and I like to joke now that we've uh, created an algorithm. Whatever size we think it is, we actually now add four. Um, uh, millimeters to the size, and that actually appears to fit in most cases. But we, um, as one of our earlier cases, we started with this device, and you can still see a reasonable amount of re leak around the, um, the jet, or the paravalve, uh, around the mitral ring, or the mitral valve, as well as the intraatrial septum. So we replaced it, recrossed, ultimately <clears> put <throat> what we call an um, Amplatz or vascular plug to um, this device kind of looks like two donuts and a, or actually a better way to look at it is like a liquor, piece of licorice or um, uh, a noun later, or not noun later, sorry, um, well, a piece of licorice. And so you can have the candy wrapper on the side and then the thick piece of candy in the middle. Um, and so that is exactly where this is fitting in between the structures um, in order to kind of in, to seal that leak in, in a very appropriate fashion. So we're very happy with that result. She has much less of a leak comparatively. Um, even if we do see this leak, as the valve starts to, or the body creates its own panis around this uh, prosthetic device, there will be less of a leak uh, over time. And, uh, and that's exactly what has happened for this patient. So case number two was a lady that presented from an outside hospital um, in a much more urgent fashion. Um, she was a young lady, 42 years old, had progressive lupus and CKD actually had a fairly recent um, St. Jude mechanical aortic valve replacement and a mitral valve, uh, mitral valve annuplasty. She presented to the outside hospital with acute renal failure, continued hemolytic anemia from an uncertain etiology, and actually suffered an PA arrest due to significant blood loss. At the outside institution, they uh, started with just a transthoracic echocardiogram, but were unable to clearly visualize any um, issues with the, the prosthetic valves. Uh, she was transferred to our institution for further follow-up and noted by a transesophageal echocardiogram that she did have a significant mitral annuloplasty dehiscence or paravalvular leak in this situation. So again, kind of resetting our, our pathway, left atrium, left, right, left ventricle, right atrium, right ventricle, mitral valve. And so you can see these sharp borders is where the, the valve itself is still intact, but the annulus has been recreated with the ring. 
And now we've now these pictures are much better as you can see our 3D imaging. And so we are taking literally several different pictures of different different um, slices of the heart that then then the probe itself <laughs> reconstructs our image, and we're able to see the mitral valve annular plasty ring, and you can see the mitral valve in between. And so I want you to look kind of here between nine o'clock and eleven o'clock on the picture on the ring on the next view, and you can see, in just a second actually, I'll go back to the 3D in just a minute, but you will see the leak that is um, coming around the ring itself, and you can see the two jets. We thought that this was not actually coming through the, uh, through the annulus itself, but actually deflecting from the dehiscence or the paravalvular location and um, getting shunted over, or getting um, kind of uh, pushed over to, into the uh, annulus ring itself. So again, here's that 3D view, and you can see nicely that there is a hole in that location, um, and that is what was most likely causing her hemolytic anemia um, with no other, with a pretty thorough he um, hematological workup. Um, and she, this lady was requiring a, a couple units of blood every two days or every couple of days because of the, uh, how, how significant she was losing um, her or hemolyzing. So with color jet, you can see the leak again between nine and eleven o'clock. And so this is what I was describing earlier, where we can use 3D. And this, this one we took a little bit more of time in order to cross into that um, around the annulus. Uh, we were able to identify where our sheath was across the trans transeptal um, and I direct it directly, specifically into that location. And we were able to wire and note that we were actually around the annulus, not through the annulus. Again, um, here we, we, had, we tried, did a couple of trial and error, but ultimately we picked plus four, again, exactly how our new uh, formula is. But it worked really well. Um, we were able to put another Amplot's vascular plug two in that location. Um, you could see that now there is a much less of a significant jet in that location um, that was originally located. And then this is our 3D view where you no longer see that jet. In any, and so you may still see some through the um, uh, annulus itself, but that's because of this, the deflection of the device. Um, I think we, she actually, um, about a week afterwards, um, was here still in the hospital. No further blood loss, uh, or at least hemolysis, um, was able to be discharged um, and without any other complications. So um, that's my favorite it's a, kind picture. of a blown you can up really picture. really see that plug beautifully. It's just so pretty there. <clears throat> yeah, worked out really well. Mm. So to follow up on both patients, um, the first patient had no further heart failure symptoms. I've seen her in clinic about six months out now. Um, her atrial fibrillation, she's actually been able easier to control and hasn't been in sinus most of the time. Um, patient number two, like I mentioned, stabilized blood counts, discharged shortly after, and has had no further rehospitalizations at our institution. I have not heard um, of other, anything otherwise. So thank you, and I appreciate that. I'll take any questions if there are any from the audience. <clears throat> We have nothing from the audience, sir. I'm kind of just stunned at how good okay. that looks. That was really, really spectacular, VJ. Way to go.